all the ones that Daphne and Simon were doing up and down around the house that was very 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 on turn like very very looked down on it is according to the turn it's very very wrong to be in love with your wife like that's such a gush um, emotion <laughs> How are you doing? My name is Lola and this is your safe space for all things self-care, self-love and personal development. Uh, today we'll be talking about Bridgerton, love and life lessons from Bridgerton. Because I feel like there were a lot of relatable things in there and it was it was a pretty interesting watch. It took me a long time to watch it but I finally did. I enjoyed season 2 more than season 1. I think like most people, regardless, both of them had interesting um, scenery and interesting lessons that would like us to pick apart and discuss. If you're interested, please keep watching. And if you aren't subscribed yet, please do please to subscribe. Please also make sure to like the video if you do end up enjoying it. So season two was definitely more of my jam because I'm more of a cantony fan. I'm more of a like a sensual and sexual, you know, lover in terms of content. I prefer more, you know, people and maybe that's why I like a drama for you. Anyway, the number one thing that I think was a big issue and that was like a main thing throughout the chatting was communication problems. It was clear that communication was just a stumbling block for everybody. And that's normal because I think that's even a problem for many people in their relationships. Number one thing about this channel, whenever I say relationships, I don't mean only the Romantic, it could be platonic, it could be friendship, even like your personal family relationships, work relationship, whatever. Just between two people, interpersonal relationships. So I think communication issues was clearly a big problem. If you see between Simon and Daphne, Simon feels like, oh, I thought you knew what I meant when I said I couldn't not give you children. And then <laughs> and then it was clear between Edwina and Kate in season two, the two sisters. Kate was keeping things from Edwina, waiting for the right time to share things. I feel like with all the movies and all the things that we consume at this point, like if everything goes on about how communication is a big problem, you should communicate quickly and honestly, but they always drag it out to the end on somebody like, oh, you betrayed me. I'm like, no, that's not what I meant to do. And then it's a whole thing. So I feel like communication is something that is still a huge problem for many people and was clearly a problem in Bridgerton also and was dragging the plot forward. I think another thing that was really starting me was making hard decisions in love. People always like to ask like, oh, you know, love is something that's so out of my control. I very much believe that love is an action word, it's a verb, it's intentional. So if somebody is doing something that you don't like and it's not just um, loving, uh, it's also necessary as part of love to contemplate. I can see that in the opera singer Sienna, she obviously liked Anthony and you know, that could never happen, right? Their relationship could never happen because nowhere can a Viscount marry an opera singer. And then because he realized his duty, he had to leave her. I'm sorry, if I didn't already mention spoilers. Spoilers. Yeah. So obviously his duty is that he can't marry her, so he had to leave her to focus on finding a wife. Because if you notice um, with Will, that was the boxer. So um, he had a business and everything. The thing with Lord, Viscounts, Dukes, and the rest, you know, barons, um, elves, and all, is that they can't work. They don't work. Working is something that is below their station. So what they do is they marry wives that have a dowry, a big dowry, as big as possible. And so then they now take their own money and that's when they used to maintain their own or their own whoever. Anyway, in the town. So he had to marry somebody that also had the money. I know Bridgerton didn't really focus on that. And I can't really remember but from the books because I think I've read almost all of all of our books. Yeah, I used to be a huge big thing fan. Not so much is still karma anymore. But I can't remember if they're going to discuss it, but having marrying somebody that has money is very important. Oh, yes, it was mentioned that was why Petrina, we want her name, uh, Frederick, is that he couldn't marry because of the diary thing. The diary was pretty, pretty important. The point is, even though Sienna clearly liked Anthony and he was also attached, she just couldn't stay with him because she realized that it was going to drag her down. He can't offer anything. And as an opera singer, she needs long protection, right? All the men that say, oh, the women of nowadays, all you care about is money. You know, women have always cared about money because they've always had to care about money. If she didn't have a protector, she wouldn't have a house, she wouldn't be able to wear nice clothes. She can't wear nice clothes and a nice thing that in fashion. What kind of opera singer would she be? She's a performer she, and then she can't earn money. You know, that way, it's unless being an opera singer. And you know, it was really tough for her. She tried that many times. So, but when he left her, she was heartbroken. She found somebody else. She was just to move on because an opera singer can't worry about love. We love pay your bills, 
So, but she found that and then she tried to find somebody else that didn't work as a sister in time and couldn't touch it. But then she was like, no, 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 I can't do this with you. You're going to ruin me. And so she had to cut it. And that's just sometimes it's necessary. You have to make hard decisions with love. Another thing that was really glaring that really stood out was um, the effect of our mar parents' marriages on our lives, on our future relationship and current relationship, whatever. It was clear that Simon's re re parents' relationship, his mother and his father, their strange relationship, how horrible his childhood was, really affected and damaged things for him. And that was why he also struggled with Daphne and that's why they had those problems. It was clear that Anthony's parents' love really affected him to think that when you love somebody, the other person can move on, grief can be overwhelming, really struggled because of how attached to us, to their father. And so he was trying to avoid that kind of thing, like loving somebody too much, somebody loving him too much, that they can't move on, can't take care of their kids after. It's so sometimes that like your parents having a bad marriage affects you. Your parents having too much of a good marriage affects you. And so it's like love will always do it. So uh, if you don't get over whatever damage or whatever trauma you have from your childhood or with your relationship with your parents, it's very, very difficult to build any kind of relationship. Fix your baggage before you hop on the relationship train. <laughs> I think one of my favorite characters actually was like Lady Fredrickson and Lady Bridgerton. Just basically the older women, they were just like so much fun to see. I always enjoyed anytime Lady Bridgerton and Anthony had like banter. Not really banter, more like slim because she's always hilarious and she just was so humble. Every time she's like, Anthony, would you have some cold pie, please? And she was just always like shading him because he takes me so seriously. Even though she's his mother, because he's the Viscount. I can tell I was a bit because this is in charge of also our own future. For example, if you wanted to throw her out of the house and ship her somewhere else, he actually could. That's how much power they had, like being owning the title and being the head of the family. The Federal thing to me was such a goal, like that's the queen of shamelessness. Like that's what you should aspire to be in terms of shamelessness, not in the way she was horrible to everybody else and to our children, but like just she is a clear hustler and I actually admire that hustler spirit. She's the villain. She's the actual villain of the story to everybody. Okay, not really. But she was hilarious in the way she was just very determined to get the children married, regardless of what happens. Even when they try to do the Bridget scene, you know, by passing off Marina's pregnancy, she tried to pass it off as Collins, you know. Even when that happened and they were clearly caught, she still had the audacity to ask for invite to party. Like that's the kind of shamelessness and go get her behavior that you need to adapt in life. So that was a major lesson for me also. I know that's a very weird lesson, but a lesson nonetheless. So even though I loved the feminist, you know, um, theorist themes in the old movie, because there was really a lot of feminist themes, you know, with the movies, you know, running her own business, how determined how hardworking she was, you know, women in control, Lady Danbury, her strength, her confidence. I love to see more of that than Eloise's um, angst. You know, as a feminist, but I also get it because, right, the Danbury has grown, she had married, she could afford to do all the things that she wanted. But Eloise really struggled with like being next in line to get married and having no choice because honestly, she had no choice, nothing she could do. There was nothing she could do after it. And any small thing, any small news could bring a woman, regardless of rumors, the truth had no ground when rumors did during that period. I think even now, no matter how much you try, if you can like it more, the more salacious the story is, the more people prefer it over the truth. And so Eloise was a bit tiring for me. Oh, and she just always tried to like drag Daphne down with like her old, she was a good Daphne. Everywhere she came into, everybody's mood was put down because of her behavior. And it was kind of tiring, right? Like being a feminist doesn't have to be so moody. But I also get why she was so angry and so upset and so and it was very frustrating. It's not something that we have to relate to because people like Eloise are clearly fought for feminism and so that's not something that we have to deal with now. So I can afford to make this statement. But at the same time, I just wish she was a bit more light. But I guess not everybody can be light. But it was also clear that um, our grief with Daphne was mostly because Daphne was happy to embrace you, know, get married thing. And she said, if you run into getting married, I'm next in line, then I have to worry about getting married. So why don't you slow down? But Daphne is like, no, 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 I was raised to build a family and that's what I want and everything. And so, of course, someone like Daphne will always grow up and lose the wrong way because they are direct opposites. And anyway, Daphne is embracing all the things that Eloise is sick of. And as much as I 
empathize a little bit. I just wish she was more, you know, more such a vibe killer. <laughs> Wonderful display of love and marriage. I think for everybody it was Will the boxer and his wife. They were both very interesting people in terms of like I love to see their relationship, their dynamic, and I wish to show us more of them. The wife is such a <laughs> such a straightforward, I love it, and supportive wife, and is also very much about his family and catering to them. That's one of my best tricks to see actually. Smart mouth wife and oh forgive my wife I'm just an indulgent husband and let her be herself kind of truth. Another lesson to me was creating your own happiness um, and that brings up the pregnancy making which is probably why she's one of my faves. But like you could tell when she was something like me and she was saying about how you find happiness in your life as time goes on. She wasn't obviously happy to marry Lord Frederick then, but like she really cared about her kids, even though she was horrible to Penelope. But she really cared about doing what she thought was best for them, right? In a misguidedness. And even when the husband thought, oh, I'm the head of death and everything, when there were problems, it was a shoulder that I came to cry on. She was the one that Help them a little bit, even with the new Lord Frederick that came. She was the one that planned the old mastermind criminal uh, ways for them to make money. Like it was clear that God dealt a lot of shitty bad cards, but she did what she thought she had to, to survive, and that's admirable. Something I wish that it, obviously in life, don't do that to the detriment of others, but at the same time, that's something to still admire. You can't kick her down. And the season two ended with her the best party just like she wanted, you know, for everybody to finally respect her and see that, oh, she actually can hold her own when it comes to training party in its own. And so you've got to admire <laughs> that kind of dedication, determination. Yeah, speaking of Penelope, her poor, poor daughter. Penelope has a little down, not surprising. I saw that coming because I know one of these writers like to go the angle of who is really suspect. And so she was declared and also like there were certain patterns and things, you know, just like Lady Dan Bury was pointing out, it was someone that clearly had time on their hands and not a servant. So I could already tell that it was Penelope. And this is not just because I read the books, right? I read the books but it was such a long time ago and I've forgotten actually. I forgot who Lady Dan was from the books. But I remember it but I was watching it, I was like, it's giving Penelope and it was. I wish Penelope could have been able to spend her money. Penelope was another example of feminism, although some people were like the way she dragged Eloise and very very young feminists. They are all young, let's not forget. All of these girls are like 18, 17. Yeah, all of them are like 18, 17. So they are all very young, let's not forget. And she thought she was just doing what she thought was best to help her friend without exposing herself to was selfish but at the same time I really admire that she was doing the right thing you know she was really calling is not deserving she I'll get to call it name she was really um putting herself out there she was you know being confident bold by writing as they whistle down it was very risky what she was doing but she was doing nonetheless the her business orientedness how she would you know, haggle bagging everything to get a good price all of that was admirable what i do wish was that she found a way to spend her money because nothing like spending your own money they are making she had all this money but she could not spend it because you know mother would obviously ask her where did you get this money she hated the dresses she was wearing all of it yellow 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 sunshine because the mother thought that that was the color that was best for her skin it wasn't but Unfortunately, I, I just wish that she was able to spend some of that money, just you know, really complete that feminist evolution for me, just to really uplift that confidence because that confidence has taken everything with calling with her mother and just generally how she feels about herself. You can tell that she doesn't love herself, the things that she says, she's not confident about her looks. She feels just oh my god, who else noticed that she looks like she could belong to Alice in Wonderland in Queen Erasabeth's court or something like somebody should call Tim Burton right now and let him start her in one of the next shows, maybe Alice in Wonderland. Colin, the dumb boy that cannot see Penelope's devotion. <laughs> Speaking of Colin, Colin is all of us in ways of trying to find where he belongs, you know, it's like Anthony is getting married, Benedict has his artistic pursuits, where do I fall in? I'm here feeling the dogs, feeling sad for himself. I think that that's all of us at some point or the other, you know, just feeling out of it struggling in trying to find your own way and trying to stand up from your siblings, trying to stand up from your peers and just trying to find where you belong. I'm looking forward to Colin's story and how we, how we eventually find his own place. It's a journey for everybody and yeah. Now let's talk about Anthony. Anthony was 
Adam is a typical firstborn, place a lot of pressure on himself. Parents also place a lot of pressure on him. And so when he sacrifices and does things for the younger ones, he resents them because he's like, oh, I sacrificed all of this for you, I did this for you, and this is what I did for you, and this is how I'm priving myself of happiness. And just like at the end, him and Kate realize that actually we should put our happiness first sometimes. We actually need to choose ourselves. And that was a very important lesson. If you end up always picking and choosing and doing things only for others, you would resent them for it. You would also not like yourself for it. And you'd be very unhappy because honestly, nobody sends you a message. So pick yourself, choose yourself, love yourself, do what is best for yourself. Everybody could be alright. Daphne and Edwina were two people that were the diamond of the first quarter. Those were two people that spoke about like pretending, having to perform because of all eyes are on you, because you're famous or you're popular or whatever reason. I feel like that's something that happens a lot in terms of like even social media with influencers. And also something that happens in general where you feel like everybody's paying attention to you or you feel like this is what is expected of you from society so you try to perform and do things that are really not in you and so you pretend a lot and you just behave in a way that is different from who you really are but so Elena was like you know what I'm not going to pretend or do this or do that all of the things you taught me I appreciate but this is who I am and this is what I actually believe in and this is what I'm going to try to do that was a huge huge lesson and that was really lovely to see Benedict, Benedict was one of my favorite characters. I'm really looking forward to his own story. I think with Sophie, I believe. Um, Benedict, you know, was sarcastic, was funny, was hilarious, had the funniest scripts and expressions. Loved to see. But it was also a clear example of like when you don't believe in yourself, no matter how much people tell you you're great, you're doing well, it's hard to believe because you don't really believe in yourself, right? Imposter syndrome was battling and pissing Benedict off. <laughs> so that was something that he struggled with throughout. And that was also another thing that was really to you and good to see. As he worked and practiced also, so like he became more confident in his art, right? He got more confident towards the end because he was practicing a lot and he was also improving. There was clear improvement in his work. Looking forward to see Benedict become even more confident, not afraid that he was taking it only because of Anthony's donation, but also just like, you know, believing in his own work. You are older, you get more confident, and Lady Danby is an example of that. She's confident, she's loyal, she's supportive, you know, she's kind, she's outspoken, and so everybody admires her for it. When you are upfront, people can tell who you are, there's no people are more likely to respect, just like the queen does over, to respect you and to admire you and to listen when you speak because you say what you mean, you do what you say, and Lady Danby was a lovely example of that. Madame de la Croix. Croix? Croix? <laughs> Anyways, Madame de la Croix was somebody that I mentioned already. I found very, very bold, very, very ambitious. Even when she was having a little dally, what they call that thing, with Benedict. When she was over, she was like, boy, bye. <laughs> I'm busy and I have other things to attend to. And so she was very, very focused on her business. She was not here for men. Marina was also somebody that was very, very shameless and very, very. <laughs> Even when she was trying to con Colin, she still had the audacity to be the one that was angry. But you know quite all right here. Yeah. She was wronged by society in general. But I still loved her bravery, her courage, you know. She actually tried to do things for herself. When that thing she looked down, it's like, yo, don't stand me here and talk down on me. What would you do if you were in my position? And she actually did what she thought she had to do. Regardless of what was calling somebody else, she would have still be trying to trap somebody else in marriage, right? And she just was trying to do what was best for her. And when she finally married the um, brother of a real love, she took that in, in stride and she was like, this is my husband now and he's good to me. I don't want to think it's best for my kids and it's just like, if you don't like me, go and kill yourself. And you know what, that's big Virgo energy. I don't know what she is, but I love the Virgo energy. So, period. And she kept telling, calling, you know, I, I, I am content, I am content. Content is a word that is banded a lot in Bridgerton. It's like, you know, instead of happiness, I actually prefer content because I feel like that links with fulfillment. And that's something I always tell my friends, like, you know, happiness is something that is fitting. One minute you're happy, one minute you're not. But like, contentment sounds more long lasting. Content, content sounds like, you know, I've made my decision, this is what I'm doing, and I am fine with it. I, it's like, it's not happiness, it's not depression or sadness, it is content. It is, level it is stable and that seems to be something that everybody goes on a lot about Bridgerton and I feel like that was also very interesting. Contentment is something that we need to have more of. It's very difficult in social media age. Everybody's doing something better than you, doing something supposedly 
everybody else is doing what is seemingly you know more successful than you are and then we, we just need a little bit more of contentment that is something that we need to practice more and i love to see that it was a good watch um, it was interesting for a good pastime it was funny um, i laughed a lot especially in season two anthony and kids can tell me forever <laughs> but yeah it was pretty interesting it was the scenes that i loved were all the um, build up scenes of where Anthony was losing his mind when um, Kate raised that leg so that she could climb over. You know, do you know period? You could show your ankle, but show your thighs. Kate was bold, bold. You're supposed to thighs. That's public indecency. So, her raising that skirt, Anthony raised his eyes when he said that he was losing his mind. And then when she passed by, and then he actually sniffed the scent, I was like, oh, my boy is down bad. My boy is down bad. But of course, he's a gentleman. I am a gentleman. I am a gentleman. I am a gentleman. I am a gentleman. Is that so? Uh, if you haven't seen Bridget saying yes, and I'm giving you all the spoilers, sorry, but you've probably seen Bridget saying by now. If you've seen it all the way here, I wouldn't really care to watch it. That's quite fine. Regardless, uh, let me know what you think of all these thoughts that I've shared. Let me know what you think uh, about the show in general. What lessons you learned because you probably have one or two things to teach me and I'll be reading the comments. Please drop them down below. If you know someone that would enjoy this video, please share it with them. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up and to subscribe because it helps. What else? That would be all. Thank you for gracing me with your attention. I did you. I did you.